Today we have come to visit Professor He Zhonghua in Lijiang, Yunnan. Professor He, thank you for doing this interview with us. First, would you mind telling us your name, when you were born, and some of your experiences when you were growing up? My name is He Zhonghua, and my ethnicity is Nashi. I was born in 1937 during the Sino-Japanese War. Up until the time when I was 11 years old, I grew up in a small mountain village called Shergu, near the Jinsha River. My hometown was Gucheng. Only after I turned 11 did I return to my hometown, Gucheng, in Lijiang. Basically, I attended elementary school, middle school, and high school in my hometown. Prior to fifth grade, I was in Shurgu, and then from sixth grade straight through until I graduated from high school, I attended school in Gucheng, Lijiang. This region has been the main area that claims a large Nazi population. It also has many Han people. Those Han peoples, whose ancestors came to the area a long time ago, all wear traditional Nashi clothing and speak the Nashi dialect. They call us the native people, and we call them the Han people. We live together in peace and harmony. So we have always all been extremely friendly to each other. This area has very many other ethnicities. On the other side of the Jinsha River is a Tibetan ethnic minority area. Also on the side where Mount Small Xiaoliang is, there are the E ethnic minority people. In addition, the Bai people live in this area with us. In fact, the environment is like living in a big family full of people from different ethnic groups. Because Lijiang is an area where a lot of Nashi people live, it has become the only autonomous county for the Nashi ethnic group in the whole county, in the whole country. The Nashi, Nashi ethnic group's autonomous county is Lijiang. In the past, this area was called the Lijiang Nashi Autonomous County. Now, after Lijiang has turned into a city, it is called the Yulong Nashi Ethnic Autonomous County. So I grew up surrounded by Nashi culture. My parents and all of my ancestors are all Nashi peoples. Thus, I have very strong feelings for the culture and many other aspects of our ethnic group. What did your parents do? My mother was an ordinary Nashi woman and lived on... Well, we lived in a small rural town. She mainly was involved in the small handicraft industry. Take a look. This thing that I'm wearing on my back. This is my mother's embroidery. Oh, how beautiful. My mother took care of me when I was young. She left this to me when she passed away. She made her living by making embroidery and selling small goods. As for my father, he went to the front lines in the war against the Japanese when I was one year old. So I don't remember him. I have heard that he was a teacher at the village elementary school. So you never even saw your father? I never even saw him. So you were raised by your mother? I was raised by my mom. Mm. Did your mom have a very big influence on your life? Yes, very big. I was born and grew up in a Nashi ethnic area that had Gucheng as the center. Starting from the period of the Ming Dynasty, this area began to be influenced by the Han culture. At that time, we were ruled under the tribal chieftainship system. The headman's surname was Mu, and the average people were surnamed He. 
Later, we began to accept and take on Han culture. Then, in the first year of Yongzheng, 1723, the border areas all changed from the tribal chieftainship system to the standard Chinese bureaucratic system. The central government sent officials to govern ethnic minority areas. So at that time, those officials implemented the policy of civilizing ethnic minorities with the Chinese culture. It means they had proposed that the native people learn the Han written language and imitate the Han customs. In order to accept the Han cultural education, changes were made to some of our ethnic customs. We had to follow the Han customs. So the culture was like this. Take, for example, my mother's Nashi ancestors. Since the policy of changing from the tribal chieftainship system to the standard Chinese bureaucratic system was implemented, ordinary people's children started to have the opportunity to go to school, where they would be taught about Han culture. Also, the Imperial Civil Service Examination System opened opportunities for scholars to have an official career. My maternal family produced a Hanlin. In the history of our Nashi people, there were only two Hanlins from the Yongzheng era to the early 20th century when the examination system was abolished. There were also very many Jinshu, but I can't remember the exact number. On my father's side, my great grandfather. My great-great-grandfather was an imperial student by virtue of a special selection through the imperial civil service examination system. In the past, the Han peoples believed it was important to build marriage alliances with families of similar socio-cultural status. Thus, the influence of Han culture on the upper echelons of the Nashi people was very deep. My mother was born and grew up in this kind of environment. Well, my grandmother got married when she was 17 years old. This was an arranged marriage. Her family took on the customs of the Han people, and her marriage was arranged. Later, because she didn't give birth to a boy, my grandfather married several other women since he was the only son in his family. Therefore, my grandmother, who was left destitute, took my mother and my mother's younger sister to the waterfront area of the Jinsha River in order to make a living. Later, after my aunt, my mother's younger sister, got married, my mother and my grandmother lived together. Then I was born. My family was special since it consisted of three generations of women. My grandfather married concubines and they lived in his hometown, while we lived in the Jinsha waterfront area. After my mother got married, my father left home to fight in the war. Therefore, my mother took care of my grandmother and lived with her. I also was a girl. So these women of three generations all lived together. So your mother only had one child? She had given birth to a boy 12 years before me, but he didn't survive. So in fact, it was only you? Yes, just me. I was an only child. So since you grew up in this kind of environment, did your mother and grandmother have a big influence on your life? They had a tremendous influence. My grandmother had a really strong personality and was the kind of person who was always ready to defend the weak against injustice. Therefore, in her hometown, there are still stories told about her. When I was young, my mother had to go out and make a living for us, so my grandmother took many of the responsibility for raising me. Therefore, I was taught about a lot of medicinal herbs and also many stories about the Nashi people. My, grandfather, my grandmother taught me all of these things. Since the time when I was very young, I grew up being told Nashi stories. Therefore, I learned of the Nashi culture at a very young age. My grandmother was my earliest teacher. But later, when I had not yet turned 10 years old, my grandmother had to leave to take care of my aunt, the daughter of my grandfather's concubine. My grandfather had married several women in the hopes of having a son, but none of his wives had boys. Therefore, my grandfather took a man into the family as his son-in-law for that concubine's daughter. After she got married to him, they had a child. My grandfather's other wives all had already passed away, and my grandmother was the only wife who was still alive. So he took my grandmother back in order to take care of the household. So from that time forward, I lived with my mother. She really had the greatest influence on me. She was extremely honest, kind, and very industrious. She was also very tolerant. All of her qualities had greatly influenced me.
The other situation that had a big influence on me was the special composition of our family household. Basically, my grandmother was a widow with a living husband. My mother also found herself in this situation, compared to that of a widow. Thus, at that time, my mother was bullied by other people in the clan because she gave birth to a girl. If I had been a boy, we would have had a very different status in the family. In addition, she was looked down upon because my father was not at home. Later, I remember I wanted to attend middle school. Since my mother felt the Jinsha waterfront area was not very safe, she wanted to move, back, to move back to our hometown, but at the time, they did not allow her to do so. They told her to wait until my father came back, and only then would they allow her to return home. I always thought that they bullied my mother. At that time, I remember wishing that I had been born a boy. During that period when I, when I went to elementary school, middle school and high school, before I went to college, I grew up in the Nashi area. So even though we studied Han culture, we were immersed in Nashi culture in our surrounding environment. I grew up in this kind of environment and never really felt like I was different. Then I went to a college in Chongqing, which is the present day Southwest Normal University. Before I was 10 years old, we moved from the Jinsha River's Grand Canyon area to the city of Guchang. The move to the city really broadened my perspective and way of looking at things. Then I moved from Guchang to Chongqing. Chongqing was a place of strategic importance in the southwest and therefore further broadened my vision. From an intellectual perspective, it was the feeling of moving from the edge of the well to the edge of the sea. Thus I felt really happy and very lucky. Since before the establishment of the new China, very few Nashi women had the opportunity to go to college. After all, this was extremely rare. So I was very lucky to be offered this opportunity to attend a university. At the time, the country was advocating the equality of men and women and the equality of the different e ethnic groups. I directly benefited from these government policies. Therefore, I was able to set foot in the treasured halls of academia. At that time, I was a student in the Chinese language department and eagerly took in everything that I could. The Han Chinese culture is broad and profound, and this rich wealth of knowledge excited me beyond belief. It also caused me to even more deeply love the big family of the Chinese nation. Meanwhile, historically, ethnic minority areas were considered to be barbaric and backwards because the lack of a mutual understanding in addition to some discriminatory, discriminatory government policies in the old times, people on the outside really had very little understanding of ethnic minorities. Although at the university, the learning environment and the teachers were excellent and my classmates were all really good to me, sometimes they raised some questions that were so ignorant that I did not know how to deal with them. I really came to understand how little others knew or understood about ethnic minorities. So as an ethnic minority, I felt I had a kind of sense of responsibility to my people. Since I had the opportunity to earn an institute of higher education, an institute of higher education, I must repay my people by helping others gain a better understanding of the real situation of ethnic minorities. Yunnan is a province in the border area that has many different ethnic groups. 26 different ethnic groups, 25 of which are ethnic minorities, have lived on this land for generations. Each ethnic group has its own unique and rich culture. As I said earlier, these cultures must be made known to others. Therefore, there are many ethnologists and anthropologists in Yunnan province who are making such efforts. 
So as a woman, I studied the cultures of ethnic minorities with a special emphasis on the Nashi culture. This was because I was already quite familiar with Nashi culture. I felt that I was well positioned to study the language, culture, and mentality of the Nashi people. Moreover, I also had the opportunity to enter the Chinese language department to study, and this was another advantage. Therefore, I took full advantage of my resources. I would count as one of the earliest people who paid attention to the cultures of ethnic minorities. In my research, I felt that women have played a unique role in creating, preserving, inheriting, and promoting ethnic minority cultures. However, the role had not been recognized. Therefore, I focused my attention and research on women in ethnic minority groups. During this time, that is, for the more than for more than tw the past 20 years, I have traveled to nearly all of the ethnic minority border areas in the province. I would like to briefly introduce several of the ethnic minorities. These are the E people. All of these people live in Yunnan. These are the Tibetan minority peoples. Here are the Lusu people. All of these pictures were taken when I was doing research, so you can see me in there. These are the Jinnuo people. These are the Pumi people. Here are the Dai people. Here are some Mosuo people of our Nashi ethnic group. There are also many other ethnic groups, but here I will not introduce them in detail. Professor He, in yesterday's interview, you talked about how you came to pay attention to the cultures of ethnic minorities. Uh, then you described how you came to emphasize minority women. Did you change your research focus through some projects? I myself went through a process when I changed from the study of ethnic minority cultures to that of researching minority women. In this transformation from studying culture to studying women, <coughs> my focal point was women's culture within ethnic minority groups. This was the period before the 1995 World Women's Conference. I took part in, I wrote some articles. The earliest one was about the Nashi Dongba culture. It illustrates the evolution of female worship in the Dongba culture. I examined the evolution from female worship to male worship as well as the changes in women's status in this process. I started from this project and then moved on to study other ethnic minorities because there are similar cultural phenomena in these ethnic minorities. Even before the World Conference on Women, I had already participated in and helped organize the project of compiling a book series on women's culture in ethnic minorities in Yunnan. In total, there were more than 20 volumes in this collection. Basically, each volume was dedicated to a different ethnic minority. I was a participant in this collective endeavor. After the 1995 World Conference on Women, I had a clear understanding of many things. My own experiences paralleled this process. First, in my own research on minority cultures, I came to know many organizations. At that time, some overseas foundations, like the Ford Foundation, sponsored some property project and a forestry project. In the implementation of these projects, they required they as sponsors required that one third of the participants in the project must be ethnic minorities and one third must be women. 
This was a special requirement. Therefore, the people in charge of these projects tried to recruit people like me, those that were both ethnic minorities and women, into these projects. During the process of participating in this project, my role was to continuously pay attention to issues like women's status and their roles in the forestry project. This is my research in real-world projects. In the meantime, I conducted my research on culture as well. I went to the grassroots level to better understand the situation. At the time, this effort enabled me to step out of pure academic research and go to the grassroots level to learn about the basic conditions of women's lives in these areas. Looking at this from another angle, I felt that many of my resources, including the research materials and my research projects, came from them. <coughs> Therefore, I should repay these people in my research. I cannot regard them merely as the providers of my research materials or my research object. Therefore, after I had this kind of experience, I gradually changed my focal point from culture to practice, which involves projects of ethnic minority women's development. It was after the 1995 World Conference on Women when I especially felt the importance of women's participation in society. Thus, I applied for a project in this area at that time. This project investigated the participation and development of ethnic minority women in Yunnan province. That project involved more than a dozen ethnic minorities. So I went to visit many places. The investigation had a tremendous impact on me, both emotionally and intellectually. From this time forward, I could not help but become more engaged in this kind of work. I have basically invested all of my energy towards working on these projects. When I had any free time, I would reflect on what I have felt and what I have realized during the process and then wrote them down. This is basically what I did in the process. For these two years, I have become more involved in these processes. I have also personally developed where I came to understand that we should not consider ourselves as the Messiah. Instead, we should share achievements, experiences, and hardship with our sisters. I feel that we must look at things from their perspective. We should not be condescending, right? This is extremely important. I really think that this is extremely important for my research. I have learned a lot in this aspect. Later, I will discuss this issue a bit more. Mm. Then, well, my long-term examination of Mosul women was, from the, beginning, from the very beginning of this research until the completion of the book, it took more than 12 years. In these 12 years at the beginning, I was still working. If my goal was to gain a higher title or academic post, then I should have published this book before I retired. This would have helped me gain a higher position. But at that time, I thought, since I was investigating the changes in the matriarchal system of the Mosul people in modern times, a kind of cultural change that requires a relatively long period of time to investigate. I could not complete this project in one or two days. Otherwise, I would not be able to grasp the true, true nature of the changes. Therefore, I gave up these concerns and decided not to write. Instead, for many years, I simply tracked the changes. Every one or two years, I went to visit my chosen research sites and the women there. So by the time the book was finished, I had already tired. I had some friends who really did not understand why I decided to do things the way that I did. They asked me why I did not just write the book sooner. 
Actually, I did have a lot of research materials. At that time, I felt that as a responsible researcher, I should not think about the individual benefits, but instead should focus on leaving behind authentic research for the next generation. Now sometimes it is really a kind of consolation to me that the most well people highly evaluate my work because of all the efforts I put in it. When young scholars go to Mosul villages to do research, the Mosul people tell them, if you want to introduce our culture to others, please be careful. You should look at Professor Ho's book and write about us truthfully, just like she did. The director of the Women's Federation for the Mosul people once spoke at a provincial level conference. People have written a lot of articles about us Mosul, but it was only Professor Ho who really got to know us. She stood with us together and spent a lot of time with us. She helped us to say things that we wanted others to know about us. Wow, I really felt that this is the highest praise that I could receive. Although I've given up a lot of things, I feel I can console myself in this way. But I am also not saying that I, what I've written is terrific, because in no way am I perfect, and after all, I have not lived among these people, and also did not live in that area. So I acknowledge that there are still cultural barriers that I have not overcome. But I recognize that the only thing that I can do is work very hard at overcoming these cultural barriers. I cannot impose some monolithic ideas and frameworks on their culture, right? Therefore, in order to understand what these women are thinking, what these women are doing, why they want to do things in the way that they do, I cannot look at these things from my own perspective. I need to think about these issues from their point of view. Learning to see from, this, from their perspective was my greatest gained during the course of my research. So this is a, the most important aspect of my research was to pay attention to their development and changes. This is especially important in a time of economic globalization. In this kind of situation, we have to recognize that these ethnic minority areas do not exist in isolation like they did in the past. There have been a lot of outside cultural influences that have entered this area. Native cultures are facing unprecedented challenges. In this kind of situation, cultural adjustments and integrations are worth the consideration and research of social science scholars. I think that this time period when a society is transforming is extremely precious. Therefore, we need to pay particular attention to this kind of cultural phenomenon. This is the cultural aspect. Also, when we look at this from people's point of view, both men and women's communities are facing various transformations in ideas, roles, and other aspects. They also face a lot of difficulties. So in the process of my research and projects, I deeply felt there was the need to enhance women's abilities. Women should first of all improve, improve themselves. Like the old saying says, if you want to work on iron, you have to build yourself strong, right? In addition, women must actively participate. We cannot simply import outside ideas without taking into consideration our own practices. I think this approach is too superficial. So I did all of these. In the last two years, I participated in the American Nature Conservancy's Photo Voice project. As for the original intent of the Photo Voice project, it attempted to... The American Nature Conservancy and the Yunnan provincial, co provincial government collaborate to form a nature protection plan for the three rivers area of the northwestern Yunnan. Mm. This area was especially precious because of the diversity of animals and plants and its dense multiplicity of cultures. Many things that have already vanished in other areas of the world still exist there in terms of both nature and culture. Therefore, in order to make a plan, cameras were given to the local farmers. They decided what to take photos of on their own. We did not tell them what sort of photos they should take or should not take. We told them the goals of the project. It would speak about their thoughts, their perspective, and what they wanted to say through these pictures. After we did this, in my gender perspective, I felt this was a part of women's capacity building. Moreover, it can also be considered as an attempt to enable women to directly participate in significant policy making. This is the way that I look at this project. Well, today I'm going to visit He Yuning, one of our photographers. She has taken some great pictures. Many of these pictures have been featured in some publications and magazines around the world. The Yunnan television station also asked her to come to the station to discuss some of her thoughts and feelings about protecting the environment. Feedback on this has been terrific. Following is a summary of the 
conversation. After we participated in the Photo Voice project, we came to realize the importance of protecting the ecological environment and to love our nature even more deeply. We not only acted on our own initiatives, but also had influenced people around us. When we took these pictures, we had a lot of thoughts. For instance, the fish stock has been depleted. This is partially because of pollution. After we applied agricultural chemicals, we washed the bottle caps in the lake. This caused the water to become polluted. In the past, we did not pay attention to this, but now we have come to realize that this is a problem. We gained confidence in ourselves through taking pictures. In the past, things that we did not even dare to think about. Nowadays, we have the courage to take action. Now my family has contracted a part of a mountain where special mushrooms grow. During the course of a year, we must live on the mountain for four or five months to take care of the forest. When we pick the mushrooms, we make a profit of about four or five thousand yuan per year. Mm. 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 Mm.
<笑>他自己呢他也觉得自己对自己也有信心了 Professor He, could you now talk about another project that they are engaged in here? This village is called the Yuhu Administrative Village. The project we are working on here is called the Photographic Story. Why did I choose this village? This village, for me, I have chosen it based on my experience and relations with the village. The first time I came to this village was in 1993 for a tourist development project funded by the Ford Foundation. So this is what brought me here for the first time. This village in the Lijiang Dam area was very impoverished at that time. Its topography is quite high. Among the villages in the Lijiang Dam area, it is the closest to Snow Mountain. It is a village under the foothills of the, of the Snow Mountain. The area is quite poor because among other things, the soil quality is barren. The climate is rather warm, and the altitude is quite high. In addition, although it has some natural resources, they were not widely, wisely used. So there are many reasons that have contributed to the impoverished condition in this village. After all these years, the most drastic change is that it has found the village is located within the scenic district of the Yulong Snow Mountain. Because of this, it has a lot of resources. So in this couple of years, it has found a good way to develop. That is tourism. And tourism has facilitated the development of the whole economy. For example, look at the houses. Their changes are really moving for me. Every time I come, they seem to have changed and gotten better and better. Thus, this is why our photographic story project takes place here. Our project uses the picture as a method. We give cameras to the local villagers and let them show how they want the environmental protection and community development to be done. Then, the final goal is to prepare a plan for a comprehensive community development project. So through the pictures, people could find their demands and explore their potential. Right, explore their potential. 
At that time, we thought, well, I had participated in some projects carried out by foreign organizations. This time, we ourselves are in charge of this project. From the perspective of researchers, we want to explore the way to localize some foreign methods and concepts. In addition, from the villagers' perspective, this is a means of participation. This project and the photo voice project are different in that the latter project was designed as an environmental protection project. The final goal of the project that we are doing now is to establish, is to publish a handbook. We try to explore how to use photos as a method, using photos as a tool of research and a means to collect information. Moreover, this kind of information comes directly from the grassroots level, from the field. Using this method, like we have for the previous two years, one thing that we learned is that when we as social science scholars do field work in the country, we, for example, I myself, always design some methods and questions that I want to ask. Then, actually, the villagers are telling us stories that have already been framed by our minds. After we get their stories, we put them into our papers and practices, and in this process, they are filtered by our views once again, right? In this way, we are always the ones that take the initiative, and the villagers are always passive. They are not participating as subjects. Now we want them to be the main subjects in the project, and we want them to be able to express their demands and their wishes directly, and also reveal their own points of view. This would be especially important for women in the past their voice was not heard. Mm. When we were designing this project, we had a principle for selecting our participants. We wanted an equal number of men and women, people representing the elderly, middle-aged, and young generations, and those who, who, who from all levels of socioeconomic backgrounds. We also wanted the composition of the group to be diverse. The village-level cadres should not make up more than 10 percent of our group, and instead it was mainly com composed of ordinary peasants. These people are those whose voice can hardly be heard in the community planning, especially women. Their voice in the public domain is not heard. So this time, we want them to directly voice their opinions through pictures. Moreover, we pay more attention to the stories behind the pictures and how these women see things. So when we planned this project, we especially emphasized the issue of gender consciousness. Therefore, in a certain sense, yesterday I might have discussed this. They are direct participants in the planning for the entire community, the community development plan. Therefore, essentially, this is a way of promoting their abilities. Therefore, I feel this project is representative. Why is it representative? This area originally was a very impoverished village. After the development of tourism, it became a rather wealthy area. It not only became wealthy, but also people's mental outlook improved. So it was not only increasing people's income, but changes that occurred in many different areas. The people who participated in the tourism industry were both men and women. The most well-developed service was a riding guidance. Visitors ride on horseback, and they are led by guides into Yulong Snow Mountain. Mm. Men and women, old and long, old and young, served as guides. The proportion of women was rather large. They directly participated in these economic activities. In the past, women did housework and worked in the fields. That was their space of activity. Now they were engaged in the market. Therefore, their mental outlook in various aspects changed in a very big way. As we carried out this project, impoverished women gradually became more and more well-off. This within this project, there were a lot of things that we felt were really, of, really worthy of further thought. I assume that there are some local experiences. Yes, I have just discussed one of the reasons why I chose this village. That is the problem of poverty. We wanted to see how to make changes in an impoverished area so that it could slowly become better off. Another reason is that, I mentioned it earlier, 
I feel a kind of emotional attachment to this village. I first came to this village when I participated in a project in 1993. At that time, the area was rather poor. At that time, the government started to prohibit cutting down trees. This area is at the foot of Yulong Mountain and very close to the forest. Local people used to rely on lumber to subsidize the economy. Lumber became the main, became the main source of income for people's livelihoods. But lumbering resulted in barren land and the agricultural products from this area were not very good. In addition, it was hard to preserve the water and soil. It mainly was sand and stones. Moreover, there is the factor of global warming. Thus, for many different reasons, people's lives in this village in the Lijiang Dam area were quite impoverished. This made a very deep impression on me. Another deep impression was from a woman's point of view, when we started on the project of ecotourism, we insisted on a gender perspective. So at that time, the road looked nothing like its present condition. It was barely passable and the water was shallow. The road and water passage became one. Drinking water came from that area where people walk and horses pass. Therefore, this directly impacted the quality of water in the area and the health of humans of livestock. There was also another problem, the water source area. We can go in a while and see the lake. In the lake, there are salmon. People raise them to eat. Local people do not raise this fish. A, a work unit raises them. The abandoned fish, animal manure, and other dirty things all flow into these ditches. Therefore, these pollutants are a very big problem. The pollution is very bad. Therefore, after the conclusion of our project, the project group used project funds to repair a canal. Several years later, I went to this village and found the greatest change. The government allocated some funds to build direct pipes from the mountain that bring water to each household. Therefore, their water is clean now. I am moved by the way the village looks now. In addition, I came here in 1996 after a great earthquake in Lijiang. During that time, I also went there to help with disaster relief. Everything really was in terrible disarray. The dilapidated walls and crumbling buildings were a horrible scene of devastation. In the few years following this tragedy, you could still see the damaging effects of the earthquake. Many houses collapsed, but, but people could not afford to have them repaired. This happened to a lot of families. But last year, when I arrived, I simply could not believe my eyes. Oh my gosh, how could there have been such drastic changes? Therefore, I have become very interested in seeing the community develop. The final goals of our photographic story project were to publish a handbook and create a development plan in this community. This plan was designed to protect the local ecology. Also, it sought to protect and respect the cultural diversity of the area when deciding how to develop the economy and to raise the standard of living of the inhabitants. This was our thought. But actually, it was not our plan, but instead the plan that naturally came about after these photographers took the pictures of the community. From the exhibitions of these photos, all kinds of information was collected. Naturally, the blueprint of a future plan for development came into being. Then different groups of people worked on this together? Right, we all worked together on this. This woman's name is Li Jinxin. She has worked for 19 years all together as a village cadre. The second time that I came here, she had stopped working as a village cadre. Mrs. Lee, how many years have you already stopped working? I had already stopped working for 20 years. So 20 years later, the people in the village elected her again. They wanted her to work as the village party secretary. Then this time, we asked her to become one of our photographers. I wanted to ask her to talk about how the changes had impacted the women in the village and also how she feels about the photography project. 
变化以后，给妇女带来的影响。啊，还有一个呢，他对照相这个项目，啊，他的感受。那么你在家吗？那你不能你不在。嗯嗯嗯。在哪休息？哎，去这个照照相的时候，我们家的。嗯，去这个照照相时候，在我们家哥们下单过一个项目，用这个嘛。A photographic story project is a very good project. In the past, other people did not know what kinds of ideas I had. Now through these pictures, we can let the government know our opinions. Although I am not so young anymore, I can still do some things. I like doing this kind of work. In the past, our village was rather poor. Now the tourist industry has developed and our lives have improved. This has brought benefits for women. Here this region is half mountainous, the climate is horrible, and people have a difficult time making ends meet. The people had to go to Snow Mountain to chop down bamboo to make brooms in order to make a little money. This was physically demanding for women. It had also destroyed the ecology. Now they can make some money by leading horses for the tourists. This has not only increased their income and lessened the burden for women, but also has protected the ecological environment. <laughs> <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音> <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
We also have other male colleagues. Moreover, our current and future research emphasis was using a gender perspective to look at such topics as ethnic minority women, the development of ethnic minorities, natural resource management, and environmental protection. In addition, while implementing the projects, we want to continue to think about theories. <笑>好。<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>